Welcome to Black History Matters 2022, presented by the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum, also known as NAHOF, located in Peterborough, New York. Black History Matters is an educational series that seeks to highlight historical events in the Black American experience. This is one of a series of 28 videos that NAHOF will release daily throughout the month of February 2022. Videos are viewable on NAHOF's website. The mission of the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum is to honor anti-slavery abolitionists, their work to end slavery and the legacy of that struggle, and strive to complete the second and ongoing abolition, the moral conviction to end racism. This program was funded in part by Humanities New York, with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Jessica Harney. Jessica Harney has been a volunteer since 2009 and serves on the Cabinet of Freedom for the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum as the Hall and Museum Co-Chair. She has been instrumental in managing the exhibit space as well as training many volunteers. Her involvement with the board has also included work with education and promotion slash communications committees. Outside of her work with Nahoff, she is a social studies teacher at Camden High School for the last 19 years. She teaches MVCC dual credit U.S. history and New York State history, global history, and psychology. She also advises several school clubs such as Odyssey of the Mind, Amnesty International Club, and the Gender and Sexuality Alliance Club where her personal interests, classroom experiences, and volunteerism intersect, she has found herself conducting research on the 1850s Florence Farming Association of Florence, New York. She also sits on several underground railroad advisory boards and is a member of historical societies in the Oneida County area. In the last three years, she has done a number of in-person and virtual presentations on the Florence Farming Settlement for a variety of local groups. I'd like to now invite Jessica Harney to begin her presentation. Hi, thank you for watching. Today we're going to be talking about the rise and fall of the Florence Settlement, People, Land, and Freedom, 1846 to the 1860s. The Florence Farming Settlement has been identified to have been located in the Florence Hill Forest, a New York State Forest Preserve in Florence, New York. The Florence Farming Settlement was a small 19th century settlement of both freedom seekers and free blacks who established a communal farmstead through the help of state and local abolitionists, which improved their political and economic status. The Florence Farming and Lumber Association was the governance and business organization used to promote, recruit, facilitate, and developed the Florence Farming Settlement from around 1846 to 1860. The primary promoter was Stephen Myers. He's a notable black abolitionist of Albany, New York, but through research of his correspondence and newspapers, a list of additional supporters emerged to tell a more complete narrative of who he was working with. The relationship between people, land, and freedom converge in this special place breeding opportunities for self-sufficiency and democratic sustainability for Black Americans. We examine the origin of the settlement and consider ways that the political, economic, and social conditions in America impacted the decline of the venture. The application for a William G. Pomeroy Foundation Historic Roadside Marker Grant was submitted by myself on behalf of the Oneida County Freedom uh, Trail Commission and the Oneida County History Center of Utica, New York. And the historic roadside marker sign was awarded and installed in 2016 and dedicated in 2017. Since the dedication event, research on the site is continued and the sign has brought a lot of much deserved attention to this little known historic community. Earlier this year, unfortunately, it was discovered that sign and pole had been vandalized and stolen. <laughs> and it's currently being investigated by New York State Police, but uh, we hope to um, see the return of it. And if that does not happen, then we will have some fundraising um, campaigns underway to try to um, reinstall the sign and um, looking to do that 
um, later this year. The history of abolition in New York State has a lot of layers, and, um, and those layers include a variety of methodologies, factions, abolitionists, and state laws that are worth taking a much more detailed look at than what I can provide here today. And that can be done by checking out one of our other Black History Matters series from last year, 2021, and check out Abolition of Slavery in New York State, 1827 by Victoria Basolto, and the link will be posted in the comments below. By 1794, the New York State Manumission Society lobbied the New York State Legislature for complete abolition. Over the years, there were many modifications to the status of the enslaved and free persons of New York. And in 1817, New York State law offered the emancipation of enslaved people that would be born prior to 1799, and it wouldn't be effective until 1827. The system of gradual emancipation was a concession for the movement, but some saw it as progress and a step in the right direction. An additional suffrage obstacle emerged in 1821 at the New York State Constitutional Convention. An excerpt of the law is here. Like many other states, universal male suffrage was expanded to white males by eliminating property requirements in order to vote. But new voting qualifications required men of color only that they own property that was a value of at least $250. This qualification was one of the reasons that Garrett Smith and others worked to distribute property to free blacks in New York. July 4th, 1827 arrived and New York State emancipated the enslaved people of New York. In spite of this, New York also had a law called the Nine Months Law. And this law allowed non-residents to hold enslaved persons in New York for up to nine months. The law was later abolished in 1841. And the property requirements for black men to vote are actually going to remain until the passage of the 15th Amendment in 1870. Florence, New York is located near an area that was a hotbed of abolitionist activity. During the 1830s and 1860s, the region around the Erie Canal was known as the Burned Over District, an area significantly impacted by the Second Great Awakening and reform movements. One of these reform movements was the abolition of slavery. The Underground Railroad in New York is particularly important in the overall national movement but the central New York region was the bullseye of the activity. In October, 1835, the New York State Anti-Slavery Society was established in Utica, New York, and the first meeting occurred in Peterborough, New York, after opponents in Utica disrupted the inaugural meeting. Participants fled to the hometown of wealthy abolitionist Garrett Smith. We can also consider the reach of the abolitionist, uh, abolitionist press which had exploded in local markets from Albany to Utica and Syracuse to Rochester. Proximity of the Florence community to the Erie Canal brought local markets to greater opportunities and even a national market. The proximity of Florence to Utica, Rome and Camden markets allowed for access to trade, social networking, religion and underground station houses such as the Camden Wesleyan Church. That made settlement in the remote Florence um, an ideal location for rural farmers because of those other connections. The rural agrarian lifestyle was appealing to free Blacks to move out of New York City, Albany, or Utica. Owning a piece of land would also open doors for Black Americans. With $250 in property assets, they'd be able to vote in New York State. And in some ways, owning land is also a form of Black resistance. The New York State and local abolitionist activism tended across paths with Garrett Smith. He plays a central role in this story by providing land grants to free Black Americans, including Stephen Myers, Walter Hawkins, and many other families. Stephen Myers from Albany, New York, obtained his land in Florence, New York from Garrett Smith in 1846. 
With the help of other new black landowners, they organized the Florence Farming and Lumber Association for the purpose of facilitating the settlement of a planned community. They're going to promote, recruit, train black farmers in agrarian skills. They're going to employ a set of agents around the Northeast for recruitment. And they're gonna utilize the full power of the press, of the abolitionist press to promote these opportunities. Speaking of abolitionist press, Frederick Douglass from Rochester, New York, publicized and promoted the Florence community in his newspapers. And he was initially identified as a supporter by serving as an outside observer slash auditor of the Florence Farming and Lumber Association. After all, it's their governing board of the community and they wanted some oversight. He later retracted his support, which caused some controversy and frustration among the community leaders. And this retraction likely contributed to some of the factors that led to the decline of the community. As previously stated, one of the central figures in this story is Garrett Smith of Peterborough, New York. Peterborough is a small hamlet just eight miles away from the Erie Canal. Smith emerged as one of the leading abolitionists in this region, and he provided large land grants to free Blacks to assist in that 1821 property qualification for suffrage. He is a wealthy abolitionist. He is one of the largest landowning New Yorkers. And he assisted free Blacks by giving away in one region 120,000 acres of land to 3,000 families in the Adirondacks in a venture organized by John Brown, known as Timbuktu. Although most of that land was never farmed. So we see then that the Florence farming settlement is different in that we see vast promotion of the community coming from a black man, Stephen Myers, with an organized governance structure to facilitate the community. Research on this community has been done by a number of public history stakeholders across New York State, including Stephen and Harriet Myers House of Albany, New York, and the Oneida County Freedom Trail Commission. My interest in the site began in the summer, um, a summer seminar on the Underground Railroad in Central New York. And it was here that I learned that the Florence Farming Settlement even existed. And as a local history teacher, that intrigued me, but more so because Florence is part of the school district that I teach in. So my research on this began a few years later with then a professional development offering that trained educators and their librarian partners to conduct local archival research. This experience, experience gave me the research tools to finally seek the answer that myself and several students had pondered. Where was the Florence settlement located? I'd ask students, I'd tell them about it. They would immediately respond with, where, where, I live in Florence, where is it? So we set out to find the deed and to try to identify the location. We located the Garrett Smith Stephen Myers transfer deed at the United County Archives building. And we worked with the tax map room to determine an approximate location of the parcel. A partnership, partnership of researchers and professionals from across the state and local Camden High School teachers began research in 2013 and participated in a collaborative site excursion in 2014. More on that later. The town of Florence, if you're not familiar, is located in the northwestern corner of Oneida County. The Florence settlement was in the northwestern corner of the town. Research of documents, historic materials such as deed transfers, census records, tax records, maps, newspapers, letters, et cetera, assisted in developing a narrative of the settlement as well as some more information about a likely contemporary location of the historic site. Some of the document research included a um, Columbian Washingtonian newspaper article from Hudson, New York, in November of 1847, that gives us an idea of the origin of the group. Um, it reported that there was a call for a convention to discuss westward emigration to lands given by Garrett Smith. In that article, Stephen Myers is listed as an agent. A year later, December 8, 1848, Frederick Douglass's paper 
we see an article printed that gives progress of the settlement that is now already underway. It made reference to a meeting held in Albany um, and provided an update of some resolutions that were made. They empowered a chairman to appoint agents to collect funds. They identified and listed where some of the agents were located, which gives us an idea of the vast reach of the promotion of the event. It includes places like Rochester, New York, Pittsfield, Mass, Catskills, um, Barrington, Mass, Syracuse, New Milford, and Bridgeport, Connecticut. So pretty much a Northeastern reach. And most of these agents that they identified included reference. And um, that reiterates kind of what we already know about the role that um, Black churches have played in abolitionist activity. Another article, uh, this one from the North Star, 1848, reported that you know, more information about the site being already underway. Um, the transcription is an experiment. We understand that a number of enterprising colored men in this and other states have in contemplation to establish themselves in a neighborhood in the town of Florence, Oneida, New York. Sorry, Oneida County. They have contracted for 100 village lots containing one quarter of an acre each with the privilege of 25 acres each additional in the immediate vicinity. Several of our most worthy colored citizens are engaged in the enterprise and from the spirit which they evince and their general intelligence, we cannot doubt that the experiment will, be, will prove successful. One of the most valuable documents that gave us information about this site has been that of, a, of a, the Oneida County record from Gillette's map of 1858. And here in this image, we see an excerpt from Gillette's map. The survey of the map occurred around 1855 to 1856, and the uh, 1858 is the date of publish. As we zoom in to the highlighted portion, we can cross-reference the names on this map with 1850 and 1860 census data. And we can find that G. Washington, J. Youngs, N. Lawrence, W. Hawkins, D. McCoy are all identified as Black residents in Florence, New York. So the names highlighted in yellow have been verified with census data and identified as Black Americans. And we see that they're clustered. Uh, the cluster of these properties, as well as the proximity to the Myers property, which would have been on lot 16, led researchers to identify this location as the Florence Farming Settlement. Additionally, deed transfers uh, records had referenced you know, land by lot numbers, and therefore we can pull together that the Florence Settlement may have included portions of lands from lot 16, 15, 29, 30, 31, 43, um, all that are kind of listed here on this graphic. In addition to the historic document research, ongoing research, research of portions of the settlement it, um, have occurred through archeological research techniques. We've used surface reconnaissance, raking and clearing, metal detecting, photography, GPS coordinate plot, plotting, mapping and sketching, more that we'll, I'll show you some examples towards the end. Um, and all of this has helped us to further understand the site and in these images, the 2022 crossroads section of Mulvaney Road, Maple Hill Road, and Florence Hill Road um, in the top right of your screen is a Google image showing the property. And you can compare that. And I've attempted to overlay this in a way that you can see the comparison to the 1858 map. Images of the land today show that the land has nearly reverted to its pre-settlement condition as it is almost entirely covered by forest and small brush. The forest consists of partially coniferous and deciduous trees with small shade tolerant trees on the ground level. And due to the terrain, some of the seasons are more conducive to access and research, but the site is open and used year round as a New York State public forest. Visitors should be mindful of the hunting season calendar. Mulvaney Road, as you can see here in the image on the right, is minimally is a minimally maintained dirt road. And um, that's basically for the state forest to access. But this is a, 
makes good use for us to um, have mobility by foot into the settlement area. There are some clearings and that identifies maybe some remnants from past fields, but you can see that the farming would have been challenging here. The soil remains rocky, showing that you know, farming would have been challenging. And also there's evidence of 19th and 20th century settlements appearing as arranged rock foundations, furrows, and you know, they had to put the rock somewhere as they were clearing the land. Corroborating evidence through document research contributed to building a stronger narrative of the site. So between the late 1840s and 1860s, we can identify this cluster of homesteads owned by Black Americans, and that's shown in the 1858 map. We also cross-reference that with US and New York State Census data, which verifies residency and place of origin, which identifies that some of the residents were even formerly enslaved people. Florence property tax records that exist from 1850s were able to show who was paying taxes as well as the value of their property. Some of the deeded property transfers also help us build a timeline and list the participants in the community in terms of organization. Significant corroborating evidence supports the existence of this site, um, running a settlement or a collective living arrangement. Newspapers, letters, census, tax records, deeds, all of these sort of reference this as a settlement. And the Florence Lum Lumber, Florence Farming and Lumber Association is one of about 100 independent African-American communities established in New York Northern states before the Civil War. In the case of Florence, it attracted at least 17 people who had been escaped from its enslavement to settle in freedom in the North. Garrett Smith, supported this community as well as the better known Timbuktu and the Adirondacks to the help of John Brown. The timeline of Florence farming settlement begins with the date of some of the earliest deed transfers from Garrett Smith to some of the black settlers of Florence, which were recorded in September of 1846. Deed transfers were registered from Garrett Smith to Daniel Benton, Garrett Smith to Stephen Myers, and this is the Benton deed here. In a partial transcription of the 1850 census, we can learn more about Daniel Benton and his family. They were residing in Florence. Based on the census records that listed place of birth in a southern state or a foreign country, at least 17 residents in 11 families included people who had escaped enslavement. Five of these listed themselves in census records in Florence for two or more years. Seen here, Daniel lives with his wife, Lydia Benton. They listed, she listed her birthplace as Canada in 1850 and Connecticut in 1855 in the New York State Census. Her husband, Daniel, owned property worth $100 in 1850 and was listed as an owner of land also in 1855. Benton also served as president of the Florence Farming and Lumber Association for a period of time. And in 1849, a portion of Daniel Benton's land was later transferred to a Joseph Young's. Joseph Young, age 60, listed his birthplace as France in 1850 and as the West Indies in 1860, with real estate valued at $50 in 1850 and 11860. With his wife, Maria, age 50, she identified her birthplace in 1850 as Maine but was not listed in the 1860 census. Additional deed transfers show Garrett Smith selling to George Washington. George Washington listed his uh, birthplace. He was born in Maryland with property in 1860 worth $800. Mary Brown, his wife, uh, 1870, and Lucinda Lawrence, 1870, both listed Canada as a birthplace. The properties of Washington and Young's have been the priority of our site research. Other black residents included Nathaniel Lawrence who listed his birthplace in 1850 as New Hampshire and in 1860 Cape Breton Island with property worth $400 by 1860. His wife, Annabelle or Arabella listed her place of birth in 1850 as New York and as Canada in 1860. Maybe we're seeing a pattern here. The children all listed Maine as their birthplaces. Son Nathaniel remained in Florence at least until 1907. 
Mary Simmons listed her birthplace in 1860 as New York and in 1865 and 1875 as Washington, D.C. Husband Henry owned personal property, but Mary owned the farm in 1880. Prince Lax was listed as the oldest of these, and he was a, um, in the 1850 census as a farmer born in Africa, aged 115. Thomas Clark was the youngest, only 15 years old in 1870, born in North Carolina. And the McCoy family, Daniel and Eleanor and their children, all listed their birthplaces in Washington, D.C. in 1850. Walter Hawkins was the most famous member of the Florence community. He was born in 1809 in Georgetown, Washington. He was purchased by a woman named Jane Robinson. About 1825, tired of hunger and whippings, he decided to leave. On the day he was sold to be sent south with the help uh, from Robert, a waiter whom he had met at a Christian worship service, Hawkins escaped from a constable and hid in Robert's room until he managed to take the train from Baltimore to Philadelphia, accompanied by two young women who purportedly were Underground Railroad agents. In Philadelphia, he reunited with his oldest brother. He moved first to Buffalo, New York, and then to New Bedford, Massachusetts, where he married Fanny about 1842, and where all four children, four of their children were born. Inspired by his enthusiasm for an independent life, in which he could own his own farm, he brought Fanny and their children from New Bedford to Florence in 1849. Very soon, they and their fellow settlers had cleared the land, built log cabins, and sent logs to the mills. They felt comfortable in their new home. Hawkins later told his story in 1891 to S.J. Celestine Edwards, who noted the family's reaction to their new home. When the wind began to proclaim the advent of winter, they found themselves fairly well provided for, and as for their wants, were neither many nor great. They were perfectly satisfied with the common necessities of life. Hawkins himself was far better provided for when he was a slave in Maryland. They managed to struggle comfortably through the bitter cold winter, much better than the highest, highest anticipations gave them warrant. Hawkins would augment the family income by working as a waiter in hotels in Saratoga Springs during the summer, leaving Fanny to care for the farm and the children. The 1850 census listed Hawkins, age 31, laborer with property worth $50, listed him as born in Washington, D.C. Living with Fanny, age 27, and their four children, Laura, Jackson, Charles, and Harriet. Most of the residents were farmers and did some other task to allow for the settlement to be a collaborative community. Walter Hawkins recalled they built log cabins, converted bark into money, and sent timber to the sawmills, besides keeping a large stock to burn during the cold season. And in Florence, New York, it gets cold. The timber would be cleared, carving out fields. Logs were used to create the upper portions of the buildings. Lumber would be harvested and sold to the mills in Camden and Rome. Wood would be burned for heat. Bark would have been used to create tannic acid, which could be used to tan animal hides. And plants and wood would be burned and processed to create potash. Potash is a chemical compound used in fertilizer, manufacturing processes, and soap, and one of the ways that they made additional funds. Contemporary evidence of the land use can be seen in some of these images here. Rocks would have been pulled from the soil in order to construct foundations for their cabins. Cellars would be dug for food storage. Um, wells were dug and lined with stone, as seen here. There were fruit orchards planted and water would be drawn from a nearby spring. Both Stephen Myers and Douglas were owners of abolitionist newspapers in their home communities of Albany and Rochester. This could have positioned them as competing entities, which could explain a somewhat complicated relationship between all of these men, which is revealed through historic documents. There's a collection of letters between the men debating the validity and reliability of the Florence endeavor. By March of 1849, Douglas, has really grown skeptical of the project and has asked the organizers to disassociate his name with the organization. 
And in one letter, Myers responds back, urging Douglas to continue to support the project. As he argues, he is describing the usefulness of the land and its location. On that lot, there is a stream of water from Mad River, where we shall be able, by damming, to have good water power. I've always stated in my lectures that Florence was a heavily timbered country, stony soil, good oats and corn, as also good grazing land. The farms joining us, cleared land, realize from $25 to $50 per acre. The oldest inhabitants of the town say that Florence is a healthy town. They send their produce to Rome, which is a good market. I stated to the colored citizens of Utica and throughout the different sections of the country that they would have to work hard the first two years on their farms and in their lumber business. There is significant document evidence that contains promotion of the settlement. And we see that the promotion of the settlement has contributed really greatly to us understanding the timeline of the settlement. So we're really fortunate to have these documents. Many of the printed articles show overlap of content and dates, which indicates a mass press release to the abolitionist newspapers of the Northeast. This document explains that Garrett Smith's settlement is in full progress, and it describes some of the projected developments. This is by this point, 1849, just really a month after the previous documents. Garrett Smith's colored settlement in Florence, New York is now in full progress. A building to hold 70 families will be finished by the 1st of January. The property has plenty of water power and grist and sawmills have been projected. Mr. Smith has given a number of farms to enterprising colored persons and the Florence Association intend to purchase several hundred acres around them in the settlement. The village lots are selling for $3 per lot and the lots contain quarters of an acre each which will enable each person to have 30 acres with the advantage of the timber. It also goes on to talk about some of the supporters of the movement. I'll talk more about in a little bit. Many of the documents do use Garrett Smith's name and the title, which implies that he is somehow the lead facilitator of the project. However, it's likely that they chose his name for the name recognition and support as opposed to him being in charge of organizing and promoting the site to the extent that maybe others have. In the abolitionist movement, name recognition matters, notoriety matters, um, and it would be used as a tool to increase the impact and reach of their publications. This is, can be seen in several of the documents that make it a point to list the supporters and subscribers by name the value of public recognition of their support serves as both a gratuitous gesture, thanking them for their money or support, as well as self-serving strategy to garner additional support. Well, if, if he supports it, then I should. This is no different from any other reform movements, even of eras, other eras or even today. So what I've done is I've plotted the location of the newspapers that printed editorials from the Farming Lumber Association. We can see by doing this on this map, the reach of the organization through the sources themselves. The pattern is of no accident, keeping in mind that they would have sent press releases to these sources. They likely promoted the settlement organization in cities that were identified as known underground act railroad activity. For example, Sandusky, Ohio, it's located right on Lake Erie, which holds significant prominence to the Underground Railroad for transport across Lake Erie to Canada. New Bedford, Massachusetts. It's a small port whaling city of South Boston, also the city that Frederick Douglass came through. Known anti-slavery context exists there. Florence resident Walter Hawkins lived there prior to moving to Florence. Philadelphia, New York, Albany, Utica, Rome, Tabor, Florence, Syracuse, Rochester are all places that are synonymous with the Underground Railroad, as well as urban centers that were supporting a free black population. Promotion in these places had a great impact on who they could reach and the message of empowerment that they were sending to the Black community. Consider they're promoting to free Blacks to leave the cities to avoid discrimination and to be able to become more self-sufficient. They are urging free Blacks to become landowners in order to be able to vote in New York. They're targeting locations where freedom seekers would likely pass through. That's their audience. They would likely have allies in these locations through the abolitionist newspapers and be able to really take full advantage of the abolitionist press and underground railroad network. 
some of the supporters and subscribers were listed uh, by name. And these are some of the more notable examples. Millard Fillmore, um, in case you don't know who he is, he was a congressman, vice president, a pre and president of the United States, 13th US president. And at the time of his support, he would have been the comptroller of New York. Hamilton Fish um, was the 16th New York state governor. And Dr. James McCoon Smith, was in New York State, um, lived in New York City, and he was a doctor, a pharma pharmacist. He was the first African American to earn a medical degree, and he's going to be listed as an agent of, of that people of New York City can go direct to Dr. Smith and find out more information about Florence. Other supporters, there were a number of others, um, Secretary of State New York, Christopher Morgan, um, notable lawyers and politicians, Jay Collier, J.C. Spencer, um, Collier was an early developer of Binghamton, New York, and um, there's other ways that people were able to gain additional support, and in some cases through presentations of skills that they had to offer. So Samuel Ringgold Ward, the first African-American labor leader, um, spoke at a Florence Farming Association meeting, as well as giving presentations in support of the endeavor. His ideology is aligned with the Florence farming community. And um, we see this really collaborative, supportive nature from some of these leaders. There are several factors that contribute to the possible decline, to the decline of the Florence farming settlement. Some of the theories that historians have identified are the influence of the press, namely Frederick Douglass and his press the climate and the farming challenges of Florence, New York, the financial challenges of owning your own property, the local society and neighbors and social changes, and then the political changes that existed. Both supporters and critics of the Florence Farming Association showed some hesitancy of the project. It was a big risk, but when one critic of the settlement emerged from a somewhat unexpected source, it's been said that any press is good press, but when negative press from a figure as commanding as Frederick Douglass emerges, it could dissuade people from moving to the settlement or taking that risk. And as a trusted source in the abolitionist community, his word carried significant weight. For example, Frederick Douglass published a letter to Stephen Myers on March 16, 1849, highlighting his concerns. There is, little, there is much doubt in this region, as well as elsewhere among our people, as to the desirableness of emigrating to the Florence settlement. And from all that I've heard recently from various sources as to the wildness of the country, the infertility of the lands, the distance and the difficulties of the way to market, an entire absence of water power, there is much to discourage emigration to that place as a suitable one for establishing a flourishing and influential town. My object now, however, is not to give any opinion with regard to the advantages or disadvantages to be derived from settling that town, but to respectfully request that my name be erased from the list of agents for the Florence Association. My knowledge of the locality derived only from a map is altogether too limited to justify me in allowing my name to stand forth prominently as connected with the association. I think this is impactful for him to say this. It's not just a letter to Myers, it's a letter to Myers he publishes in his newspaper for all to see. If this was a personal thought or feeling or aside, he could have handled this privately and he doesn't. And so this certainly, you know, uses his position to dissuade people, the opposite of what he says he's doing. The climate of Florence is no doubt a challenge for inexperienced farmers. Profit can be made from lumber on the land, you know, consider the amount of work though that goes into that and, you know, into making the land profitable and sustainable, even without considering a shorter growing season and challenging rocky soil conditions. Now, although Camden, Rome, and Utica are used to promote the convenience of the location, the reality is that Florence is 25 miles from Rome, 10 miles from Camden. Therefore, Rome, uh, excuse me, Florence is remote. And so that is a challenge. 
And this is before transportation technology that we enjoy today. A third factor would suggest that there are financial challenges. There are financial challenges to land ownership. It could have been lost due to lack of payment of taxes. Given the challenges to profitable farming in this region, it also seems reasonable to make the claim that some residents may have encountered financial challenges. They could have rendered them unable to pay those taxes. However, tax books from 1853 to 1859 show pretty consistent payments from several of the Black residents. Further research needs to be done um, to disprove or prove this point, but we do have record of at least a timeline of tax payments being made. Um, next, there are social changes from 1850 to 1860. Most notable of the reasons for the possible decline would be the social and political changes and challenges of this time. Socially, the Black community would be living amongst mostly Irish migrants that had also acquired land from Garrett Smith in Florence. Evidence suggests that Garrett Smith um, held an amicable relationship with the Irish community in Florence, deeding property and funding the construction of St. Mary's Catholic Church in town. Both communities would have had many shared experiences of poor and small scale farmers that would suggest that they could get along. There's little known evidence of any hostilities between the Florence farming settlement and the, their neighbors. However, given their similar social position, one could also not completely rule out any negative relations given that they may be in competition for some of the same resources. So the social climate of the nation is also shifting and racial tensions are mounting. It wouldn't be out of the question to see that Florence wouldn't be any different and that maybe there are some challenges with their neighbors. Finally, the passage of the Compromise of 1850 that included a stronger fugitive slave law is more than likely um, one of the major reasons that residents of the settlement felt increasingly unsafe in the region. With for hire slave catchers moving around northern states, fear of enslavement, loss of land, or even loss of life could certainly have been reasons for the settlers to move on. In 1850, Garrett Smith and Frederick Douglass organized a convention in Casanova to protest passage of the pending fugitive slave bill. Smith wrote the resolution advocating that slaves be, I'm sorry, that slaves use all means necessary to escape from slavery, including theft of materials for escape and forced against owners. Because the most famous resident documented his life, we have at least one narrative as to why someone would leave the settlement. Fearing recapture under the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law, Hawkins took his family to Canada where they could be safe. According to Celestine Edwards in his biography, he concluded, noted his biographer, that it is better to enjoy his own, pro his own liberty as well as to secure the same for his wife and children than to live in fear. He collected such things as were easy to carry away and started with enough money to take them across the border. Hawkins family moved to Toronto, Ontario, where Walter Hawkins organized as an African Methodist Episcopal church, where he um, would go on to become an ordained as minister. And um, for the rest of his life, Bishop Hawkins served BME, the British Methodist Episcopal Church congregations throughout Ontario, including hundreds of refugees from slavery in the US. Another question is, what happened to the land when the farms failed? One example of what happened to the land was seen through the portion of the property labeled as Lot 30. Given the economic situation of most people by the 1930s and 40s, farms were going into foreclosure due to the economic crisis of the Great Depression. So in an effort to facilitate economic recovery through the 30s and the 40s, New York State purchased the land and would convert it to state forests. Under President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, the CCC or Civilian Conservation Corps would manage the land and those state lands would be reforested, structures would be raised to the ground for safety. And at the time of the state acquisition of this particular piece of property, a small portion of land was owned by James Riley and it was granted to him for life use permission until his death. 
And this particular piece of land is the exact area that we've done principal amount of our archeological research and surveillance. Given his residency during part of the time, we can see some of the continuities of the use of the land and the structures there. Reforestation is going to take place. This is just a reintroduction of trees to the depleted lands in order to facilitate ecological growth. The CCC planted white pine and red pine seedlings in neat rows as seen in these images. And the plantings can still be seen today that gives us evidence and just tells another part of the story. In one part of the forest, there's an apple tree, this lonely ecological artifact of the farms that once stood in this overgrown forest. And on a somewhat of a tangent, but also re really important uh, point to also make, after one of my previous presentations on this topic, I was approached by um, a local legend named Herb Thorpe, and he provided me with some additional connections to these foreign lands. Mr. Thorpe is notable in the Utica Rome area for a number of local accolades as a leader of the Black community and change agent. His military resume is just the start of his fruitful career and impactful time in central New York. He shared with me another facet of his experiences in upstate New York, which felt like an echo from the previous century of the Florence farming community. In December of 1941, Herb was stationed in Blossville, New York, in a segregated unit of the Civilian Conservation Corps. He vividly remembers his time in the area, and he knew of Florence. While his exact work duty didn't include planting trees in Florence, it ripples the history and shadows of the past, gave me goosebumps and joy and also sadness, knowing that just 100 years before Mr. Thorpe and his fellow CCC workers arrived, brave Black farmers of the Florence farming community had cleared the land of trees and farmed this area. The fact that Mr. Thorpe was in a segregated unit of the CCC on a reforestation project in the same region gave me a twinge of irony. It also made me sad and was a real life example of the slow gears of racial progress of this nation. Some of Mr. Thorpe's accomplishments are listed on the slide. It wasn't long after his time in the Blossville camp that the Pearl Harbor attack occurred and he then enlisted in a new type of service, the Army Reserves. In his legendary life, he found ways to break racial barriers and has built a legacy of triumph and progress in everything that he has touched. After the war, Mr. Thorpe and his wife, Bessie, settled in Rome, and he continued his service at Griffiths Air Force Base. He was a charter member of the Rome branch of the NAACP and the Afro-American Heritage Association. Stephen Myers and Walter Hawkins would be proud of the kind of man and the impact that Mr. Herb Thorpe had and still does on this area. If they could only see the impact their actions had across the century. In his 90s now, Mr. Thorpe continues to give back to the community. These settlements have been largely forgotten. Smith's ambitious undertaking and its underlying themes of voting rights, land reform, and income distribution are very much applicable today. And this is a statement that comes from John Brown Lee Lives Dreaming of Timbuktu exhibit by curator Amy Godin. Many have made a commitment like John Brown Lives to bring recognition to this black farming settlement of the past out of the forest and into the public historic narrative. And I've been fortunate to work side by side with a number of people that share that passion. The research has been ongoing and we've used various techniques and public outreach that have included local presentations and publications. Even my Camden High School students from an MVCC dual credit US history course have joined in the research starting in 2016. And you know, each spring we try to go back and do some archeological field work and observation, all of which has been coordinated through the guidance of Matt Kirk of Hartgen Archeological Associates and myself, and um, also the New York State DEC, the Envir Department of Environmental Conservation. The Camden High School Archaeology Research Project at the Florence Hills State Forest was recognized and featured a few years ago in the New York State Conservationist Magazine. Um, and our collaborative partnership of researchers really did begin in 2014 with so many different stakeholders that were participating. 
The initial trip validated some initial theories and brought document research together with historic artifacts and land. We now had a place and with place there are stories. The land, artifacts, and flora tell a story that documents just can't. And if you are interested in learning more about this project or the Underground Railroad and your activity or anything else, then there will be a number of links posted in the comments below. I thank you so much for your interest in this installment of Black History Matters and happy research. Thank you, Jessica, for your contribution of this presentation. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, Jessica has provided a reference list of sources to learn more about this topic, which is available in the video description box. Please help us by completing a brief survey available at the link on your screen and also in the video description box. Feedback will help Nehoff receive funding and help plan future projects. Additionally, please contact Nehoff with any questions and if you're interested in learning more about the organization and its work. Once again, thank you Jessica for donating your time and contributing to this program. And thank you, the audience, for joining us on this educational journey. Black History Matters. We hope to see you at our next presentation.